Hello and welcome to the video for Monday, October 12th, Game Design. Hello. 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 How you doing? Not too bad. Cool. Doing pretty good, I think. Any uh, Jazz, did you get any love from the IT department? I have not yet. I also tried the email address Livia uh, sent me. Yeah. It was it was someone else, and uh, I haven't received any reply back. God, what a bummer. Uh, uh, that's all, it's all right. I mean, I, I guess for now, I'm just playing art director, uh, helping okay. Olivia kind of uh, move towards what I was thinking of for the art. OK. So so you can play art director and then have her add the information that you need or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty easy. OK, cool. That's good. All right, awesome. All right, well, let me go ahead and get you guys into the attendance into the role here, and then we'll get started. Let's see. So. Okay, game design. Mm. All right. Mm. All right. Okay, I think I've got all you guys added in. Uh, let's see. Creed says hello. Creed, are you uh, are you in a situation where you can't speak because maybe your girlfriend's working there or something like that? Yeah, no mic for right now. Oh, uh, or were you bad and she took the microphone away from you? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm grounded. He says, okay, got it. <laughs> Uh, hello, Nick. How are you doing? It's good to see you in the chat here. Let's see. Coulter says, almost not for too long. Laugh out loud. Woke up just in time. Yay. Yeah, it's probably better if you don't nap during the class. <laughs> I try to avoid that myself because it sort of interferes with the time. Um, okay, well, it's good to see all you guys or feel your vibes that you're out there somewhere. Uh, let's see now. Uh, we have one student who's scheduled to give a presentation, but I don't know, he's not here yet, so we may not get that. Um, so let's get started with some of the other stuff and then we can come back to that if he jumps into the class. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, and let's see. So uh, why don't I start out with the blog post for today. I've already got that up here somewhere. Make sure it's the latest version of it. So, uh, you know, we've all heard the phrase, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. But of course, that's a pretty ironic phrase because we all do that, right? Um, and it's true of not just books. It's true of album covers, uh, especially back in the days when there were uh, when there was vinyl, which, of course, has made a huge resurgence um, and CDs, you know, books, magazines, you name it, games and especially game boxes are going to be judged you know, by their cover, so to speak, um, as to whether or not people should engage with them, you know, whether people are going to pick them up in the store, whether they're going to click on them on Amazon or on a website and learn more. Um, so today's blog post is about so, game covers. Um, so uh, it says when customers browse board games in the store online, attractive cover art is the main reason they pick up a box or click on an image to learn more. Okay, below is the current box art for one of my board games. Okay, so uh, this is the box art. I call it the current box art because it's constantly changing. Um, but that's where it is right now. And um, then the article goes on to say, though cover art is important, the job of a box cover is to communicate multiple pieces of information to help customers decide if they want to investigate further. So um, let's see, I think if I minimize my screen size here, we can probably get both the list and the little, uh, let's see, the little numbers on there at the same time. Okay, so um, so here's a list of what I think are the key points or the priorities that you should put on a, a game box cover. So number one, the cover art. 
right? Obviously, uh, art sells games. Um, you want to make sure your art is impactful. And also, though, it should be in the style or the genre of the game, so faithful to the game, so that, you know, when people see a certain cool kind of cover art, there's an expectation that they're going to get, you know, something uh, akin to that inside the game. Um, okay, so that's, you know, point one here, which is the, the cover art. Two is the game name. Uh, and so the, the name needs to be catchy and should serve as much as possible as a summary of the gameplay. Now, that's not always possible, but, you know, if you call it, you know, lobsters in space, you know, then, you know, there's going to be explanation. There's going to be flying lobsters or intergalactic lobsters. Um, so Diner Duel, the name of this game, is a little more abstract than that. But um, you do have two key important pieces of information. One, that it's going to be some kind of a fighting or strategy game. And two, the location, right, inside of a diner. So, you know, I'm communicating at least as much information as I can with it, with the name. Um, okay, number three, which is this point over here. Uh, you want to put the recommended age of players. This can be a number on the box followed by a plus symbol, for example, 12 plus, um, to show the minimum age of players. Now, of course, that doesn't, you know, it's not like a bar. People aren't going to stop an 11 year old from buying this game. It's just, you know, you figure out where on the age spectrum uh, people will be interested in this game. And maybe below a certain age, they're going to want more cartoony games. And at a certain age, they're going to um, engage more with your type of game. Okay, number four, which is right here, um, number of players. And this is usually in the one to six range. Now, of course, it might seem strange. Um, to have a game that says, you know, for one or more players, and you're like, what is this, solitaire? Well, actually, in a sense, it is. There's been a, a big push in the last few years uh, to design games that can also be uh, used as solo play mode. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of game lovers, game designers out there who like to game buy games and don't always have people around to play them. And they would just love it if they could play that game by themselves. And, you know, when you consider how the pandemic has kind of shaken everything up, that could be even more relevant now. So if you make a game and you know you design it for sort of the average two to four players, um, you might consider how you might create some sort of artificial intelligence in that game, you know, whether it's dice rolls that the solo player does that represents the other team or whatever, or cards that represent the moves, you know, random cards that represent the moves of the other player. How can you configure the game into a solo mode so that, you know, one person can play it. Of course, with video games, that would be, you know, the programming. Um, okay, and then, uh, you know, what's really interesting is I always thought four players was gonna be sort of the average, you know, two to four players was gonna be the average for most board games. But in my research, I found out a lot of games uh, have two to five players as the option. And I think that's just based on the, the statistics that they've gathered over the years that you know, many times there's five people sitting around that want to play a game. So if you make it only for four, then, you know, you're potentially excluding somebody. Um, okay, but sometimes it doesn't work out. You know, sometimes a game that you make really works better for a certain amount of players. So, you know, five is, number five is going to have to get the popcorn and Cokes, right? Okay, uh, time to play. So that is number five right here. Uh, 30 to 60 minutes is ideal. Um, people like games or they like at least the promise of a game that they can play quickly and move on to other things or something that's going to take 45 minutes or an hour would be ideal. Um, but, you know, sometimes games take longer than that. Sometimes your risk type games uh, can take several hours. And it's fair to say that on the game box, you know, one to two hours, one to four hours, you know, uh, give, give people an idea, an indication of what they're in for when they buy the game. And then finally, a tagline, a brief summary of the game play designed to intrigue the customer. Now, what I did, you know, I asked you guys to create elevator pitches a few weeks ago. And that's exactly what I did. I, I created an elevator pitch and tried to include all of the key points that I wanted to communicate about this game. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was hard to do and there were a lot of revisions of it. I even bounced it off some people and got revisions from other people too. But this is the one that's the best so far that, that covers all the bases that we could think of. So the, the sort of elevator pitch sl uh, slash tagline on this game is, Martian commanders smuggle a miniature robot army onto Earth and conduct war games in a 1950s diner. Now, uh, it's, it's up to you to decide if that, is, if that meets the criterion, if it's intriguing and, you know, makes the customer want to learn more or if it's, you know, if it's a put-off. I don't know. You know, I, I'm too subjective. I wrote it. But 
you know, if it works, if you guys want to learn more, then you would presumably pick up the box and turn it over. And that's, that's the goal. Okay. Uh, so it says, you know, I've, I've attached the numbers from the list above to my box art. So you can see where I place specific information. I highlighted the most important text in yellow, including the tagline, name of the game, and recommended age of players. So, you know, obviously the uh, the name of the game is very important. The tagline is very important. Uh, I mostly put the the age in yellow because it would have been hard to see uh, against this black background. But then these other two pieces of information, it says additional information appears in black, including the number of players and time to play the game. So this is for two to four players and play in 30 minutes. Now, those pieces of information are, you know, arguably as important, if not more important than this, you know, the age of the uh, of the recommended player. But, you know, when you're when you're creating uh, art, like anything, there's a hierarchy, there's a visual hi hierarchy, which is indicated by size, you know, something that's bigger is considered more important by position, something that's at the top is more important by color, something that's a lighter color will stand out and be more important. So there's definitely a visual hierarchy on this and not everything when you have create a hierarchy by its very nature, not everything can be at the top, you know, it, it's an ordered, you know, a descending order of importance. So, you know, I made choices and, you know, the number of players and the number of minutes it takes to play the game is still legible. It's still visible and findable, if you will, on this box cover, but I've, I've, I've taken it down to a secondary level of importance by the font that I use, by its position, by its color, because something has to stand out. And I made my choices, what I thought was important in other games, someone else might, you know, elevate something else. One of these other pieces of information to a higher level, or I might even give, get feedback from somebody. Somebody might pick up this box and miss this information and go, well, how many people can play it? And if, if, you know, the rule of thumb is if three people give you this same sort of, uh, you know, uh, I won't say negative, but, the same sort of strengthening, you know, improvement to your game suggestions, then you really need to look at it. So if, if three people picked up this box and couldn't find a certain piece of information, I, I would know to elevate it. Okay, and then it says, um, there are many reasons people buy games. If the information on the box speaks to someone's specific needs, for example, if they have young children or a busy work schedule and can only play short games, the chances they will pick up the box and purchase the game will be greatly increased. So then, you know, so once again, these are important to those people. How many people do they have in the family? How old are the kids? How much time do they have in their schedule to play a game before they have to make dinner and, and you know, whisk off to their second job or whatever? Okay, so that's the post for today. Let me go back to the class here. Okay, so um, I do have, uh, you know, another chapter for us to talk about inside of um, the textbook challenges. But before we go to that, I wanted to check in with you guys and see if you've made any progress on your games, any prototypes we can look at, any art. What do you guys say? I got some more um, artwork done for the game and um, some of our other teammates got some more work done for the game too. Oh, awesome. Well, w uh, could we uh, see that possibly? Yeah, let me open up Discord and share it real quick. Just give me a sec. Okay, I'm going to stop my screen and I'm going to allow you to share. Okay, yeah, go ahead and take a second. Um, so Creed says, while we're waiting, Creed says, uh, that's interesting. I always like two four because they're even numbers. And he's talking about number of players. I always thought so too. But then when I think about it, there's six people in my family. Uh, I'm talking about my family with my parents and my brothers and sister. Um, so you know obviously a game that had was two to four couldn't even be played by my whole family so that's you know that would be something that would stop me possibly from from buying that game um so you know but of course every time you increase the number of players in a game and we're talking about a physical game here whether it's a board game or a card game you increase the cost you know because you have to have extra tokens maybe extra card maybe extra play mats or whatever um so you know, there's a, there's a reason that two to four is is sort of a standard because it's, you know, it'll fit a lot of different people's needs, but also it's on the low end of the cost, you know, spectrum. And there are games out there that can be played by like seven or eight people. And that's, you know, more power to them. But those games might be like $60 or something like that. So, um, Real quick. Yeah. 
Discord doesn't seem to want to open on my computer right now. I posted all the artwork I've done so far from my phone to Discord, but whenever I click on it, it doesn't open. Um, okay, I might I, have to restart my computer real quick. I don't know, but it, maybe another one of my teammates could share um, the Discord for now. Okay. Uh, any teammates of that opinion that can help? Um, yeah, one sec. Let me try to open it online. All right, perfect. Thank you. I'm sick. So while we're waiting, what do you guys think? What is, if you had to design this game you're working on as a board game uh, in the physical world, how many players would you would you design it for? I know for our game, since it's um, poker, two-player poker is a little bit awkward, so I'd make it at least a minimum of three people playing. Okay. Um, just so there's a little bit more of a betting pool, too, because betting just against each other might be a little bit weird. But, um, like, maximum players, like, I don't know what, like, the official poker tournaments are, but maybe, like, three to eight players, probably. There we go. Okay, that's nice that you could have as many as eight. I mean, that immediately makes the game more accessible to different people. Okay, you want to walk us through this? Yeah, so um, we've been slowly getting some more assets done. Um, as you can see, uh, this piece of artwork I got done today, actually, um, is the King of Clubs piece. Um, I haven't got the King logo on it yet, but I do have the club background and everything. I've got as you scroll up, um, Asai got all his the um, numbers and letters done that we can use for it. It's a little bit hard to see because that one's transparent. Here, scroll up real quick. Go to the um, one that's not transparent. Hold on. There we go. So um, as you can see, he got all that artwork done for the um, numbers and the um, lettering for all the ones we're going to use. Um, it looks really cool. I'll just have to add it to um, our artwork and stuff. Um, if he keeps going up, I got the King of Hearts, the Queen of Hearts done too. Um, and then the Queen of um, Clubs, not Clubs, Spades. Hey, can so you, I uh, still have... Can, can you uh, scroll back down to the King of Hearts down here? Now, one of my concerns with this, it, I mean, they all look great, but... Uh, yeah. I'm I'm concerned it's going to be too dark. The skin color is going to print too dark. Do, do you have the ability Maybe. to lighten that a little bit? Yeah, I, when I was looking back at this, I was just like, hmm, that might be a little bit um, awkward, but I can definitely go back and edit my um, artwork and my phone and stuff. Okay, all right, please continue. Um, so I've got some of the um, suit cards done. Asai has been working on the... Um, like the ace card and stuff. And as you can see, I got all the fronts kind of done for the different suits. Um, and we'll use those for the fronts for just like all the basic stuff. Um, but yeah, we're getting all the artwork slowly pumped out. The one thing I may change is um, the middle of the cards. As you can see, there's a split in all of them. I might try to center some images just a little bit more and maybe put something a little bit cooler looking rather than just a line to kind of split every picture down the middle, like maybe a cool looking bell or just some kind of cool looking line. I don't know, but I've gotten a good chunk of the, not a good chunk, but I've got like, I want to say a fifth of the artwork done so far for the um, King, Queen and Joker suits. So I'll be working on that, but yeah, we've gotten some um, work done so far. We've had some trouble. Um, Hugo got all the chips um, with the numbers and stuff. We had a little bit of trouble importing, which we'll have to figure out soon, but that's about all the trouble we've run into so far, but we're going along pretty good. Okay, well, I, I think it looks terrific. What, what do you guys think? Any feedback for uh, Coulter and his team? No, it looks good so far. Yeah, I think that's our next step, just modifying some of the the colors on our, on our, I'm filling in some of the uh, letters, right? I was doing that earlier, and we're going to just import them, all the updated stuff into the tabletop. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, Creed says it looks great. Nick agrees. Um, and uh, Creed also said the lettering was cool, which I, I agree. It's very, it's very awesome. I think as well as the arbor looking good, you guys have a really nice color palette that's happening there. Um, you know, yeah. And, yeah, we just need to probably adjust some of like the clothing probably on some of them and I'll probably the colors of those I'll probably yeah, make them look better. And Coulter, as far as like a line that's separating the two, I don't know if you'd be interested in this or not, but um, you know those, uh, you know, in the, in the old Western days, they would have these saloons and they would have these little, these posts out in front where people would tie up their horses. And yeah. it would usually be like two wooden, you know, two trees that were cut down and sort of shaved down. And then like a wooden uh, post, you know, that was tied over, that was nailed to the top of them. I don't know if you'd be interested in putting like a like a wooden uh, bar like that or post between uh, the two characters or not. But, you know, if you end up just just using the diagonal line, that looks good, too. But of course, you can experiment with different techniques and different images. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, OK. Uh, any other feedback or commentary on that? Uh, as for play, play testing, we're still kind of we're still getting into that. We want to get uh, the group together as a whole and then keep playing, like officially uh, play it a, a few times before uh, others can play it. We, we've, we added the marbles. That was our, the recent thing that we've uh, added. So we want to play it with that and see how that, see if we can uh, smoothly work, work that into the rules. Now, are you guys, uh, are you guys playing with just like a regular deck of cards until your real deck is finished? Yeah, we've got the backs to distinguish the different suits, which is one of the kind of main mechanics of the game. Um, but just for the front of the cards, it's, I just stole an image from Google and cut it up to use for now. But we're going to be replacing those once we actually get the cards done. Okay. Yeah, same with the chips. And, and how, how easy will it be to communicate the rules of your game to players? I mean, how quick and easy is the explanation of your game? Um, so we have oh, some rules yeah. written down in game so far. It's on um, note cards. Basically, yeah. basically just little note cards on the table. Okay. That, yeah. that you can yeah. look up and glance at really. There won't be it, it won't be a big uh thing on it, but it would just there would just be brief text on the rules or if anyone's confused. Yeah, the main mechanic that we really want to make sure that we um really drive home is the stealing mechanic between different players and stuff um with the marbles and everything um other than that it is really just five draw poker okay um but yeah okay now um have you thought up like a a name for the stealing mechanic like maybe there's a clever hook you could give to that because it seems like you know those marbles are super cool i just love the idea I'm excited to play your game because I like playing poker, but this, you know, but what, what really is the hook is, is is your artwork and things like the marbles. I don't know. You might consider if That's, you can yeah. give that. We're like slang. Yeah. Some, a little, some slang for the, for the game. Since yeah. there's kind of, I know there's slang in poker as well. So that would be good to give it our own twist. Yeah. Like you might, um, I don't know about you guys, but like I, I used to love when I was a kid, I used to love to go into the library and just like investigate things. And like nowadays we have Wikipedia and the internet and stuff. Maybe, maybe one of you would really enjoy the task of, you know, investigating a, the different slang in poker, B, um, the, some of the terminology that was used in poker that was actually played in the, in the wild west or whatever. Maybe you could come back with, you know, a list of cool terms and slang that you guys could actually put into the rules. And you could call, you know, stealing a marble could have a name, you know, like shooting the pike or something like that. It would be fun and add a new layer of, of accessibility and fun to the game. You know, I actually think uh, one of our teammates, Jaden, he brought it up. I don't think he's here today, but he brought it up last, last the time we met and for a term for the stealing. And I think he can, it was something along, uh, I forgot what it was called, what he said for it though, but it was something like how to do with bandits, something with the bandit. Or yeah, something yeah, that's like what that. I was thinking too. Like, you know, how they stole horses, like, yeah. like rustling, yeah. like you're going to rustle a card, you know what I mean? Like card rustling, you know, or, or exactly, yeah. yeah, anything like that. So, That'll cool. be neat. all right, well, that's great. Sounds like you guys are on that. So very cool. 
All right. Thank you for sharing that. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, it's looking really good. All right. Uh, who else has got something to share uh, from their game, whether it's artwork or ideas or, you know, uh, tabletop simulator stuff? What do you guys got? Well, I can show you some of what Livia's. I mean, I see she's not here today, but I can show you what Livia's been doing for our uh, game. Yeah. Let's see. I want not that screen, that screen. Okay. Uh, is it coming up? Yeah. Okay. So uh, she's been working on characters uh, for the, these are these were originally for the identity cards and uh i i kind of need to rework their mechanic because if we're not going to have mission types then what's what's the point of the identity cards and figuring out you know can we make that relevant again and keep and keep this art out of things like the, just the mercenary cards um that just that's my thinking because i kind of like uh what she's put into them so far okay um so yeah, she had me go through and, and rename them. Uh, she'll be putting them in our card templates, which I don't know if you guys have seen all of that yet. Uh, but yeah, she's she's put together a couple of card templates. This is what happened when I tried opening uh, this one in GIMP. Um, as you can see, some of the colors changed. I did turn down the fog. That was intentional, but the fog was yellow over here, but it opened as white in GIMP. So that was my that was our first discovery of oh the, the PSD opening and saving is not exactly uh, one for one when it comes to GIMP. Um, but yeah, she's she's put together a couple of different templates. Um, we've gone back and forth a little bit on the art here. I don't feel like there's any uh, real need to make major changes, but um, you know, maybe at some point we'll we'll take a. A closer look at that because I, I did like the changes I made here to, to this building um, and I would kind of like to see that implemented but um, you know again, again it's all in uh, kind of a weird art limbo for us yeah yeah that's unfortunate um, but yeah I do agree with you though I, I think that those buildings with the blue outline and the white fog are very attractive and maybe maybe you just need to share that with her and she can make those changes in Photoshop Perhaps, um, but yeah, it's uh, we'll have to put together a time to I don't know maybe uh, screen share uh, through Discord or something to to kind of really get the, the changes that I think would be a little more crisp for the type of game we're looking for. Okay, cool. Well, it looks really colorful and interesting, so um, I, I like the way things are looking. Yeah, characters. Yeah. Is a she has a couple of great uh, color palettes, and I'm pretty sure I know which one she's working off of. But yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, you know, a couple of different tests in uh, in terms of putting the game name together. But um, like, <laughs> obviously, 2034 is a little too close for comfort, so we're we're moving right. that forward. It's supposed to be 2344 as oh, okay. in up here. Um, because yeah, we're, we're we're definitely not using twenty first century tech. Um, so yeah, that's it for everything we have. Very nice. What do you guys think? You like you like the way that the cards are progressing and uh, the different styles and colors and stuff? Yeah, I like it. It's uh, I like the direction that the art is going. Livia is doing a pretty cool job. I like it a lot. Indeed, yeah, I agree. It looks really nice and. Uh, it's nice you guys can work together to develop stuff like that. Yeah, that was cool. Yes. Yeah, Nick Nick thinks it looks great as well. So, awesome. That looks great. Cool. Okay. Uh, uh, any any uh, advancements in your world, Creed? Oh, yeah. So, I was going to say, now I got my privileges back. Hey. Um, <laughs> are, are you, uh, I don't. Time out is over? Yep, yeah, time out's over. <laughs> um. I don't have access to my PC today. That's what I have Tabletop Simulator on. So I can't show anything in Tabletop Simulator until Wednesday. It's okay. just kind of hard because Mondays are like a really big overlap for my girlfriend and I. So 
but yeah, Wednesday, when we come back, I'll actually be able to access that and show you guys some of the new stuff that we've been throwing in there. Okay, sounds good. All right, uh, what about, does anybody else have anything, um, you know, it, even though you're working on things on your own or with your team, uh, it's good to show them occasionally because you can get some feedback from the other people in the class. So anybody else have anything they want to share? Yeah, I've got a new, a couple of new cards and I can show off the uh, new artwork for Man of War. Yay, okay, cool. All right. So we got, I, I put together a couple of equipment cards. So we've got like the ball and chain. Nice. And then this was the original card. And then this is the Brigantine with some artwork on it. Cool. Now, is that the front and back? Uh, no, that's just the sides. The okay. backs are currently set up with this. So this is the back of the cards right now. Okay. Is it going to have like a Man of War logo on it or something? Probably. Okay. Um, this is the other uh, equipment that I put together. And what does the 10 mean? Is that spaces or something? Or uh, No, that's how many points it it costs to equip it to your ship. Okay. So, yeah, so you've got like a 300-point limit, and each ship costs a set amount. Like the Brigantine costs 50. And so if you wanted to get it, do, use the broadside with your Brigantine, the Brigantine would then be 60 points on your fleet. Okay. And then we've got a captain card. Nice. All right. That looks good. And then I guess the other cards, like the frigate, galleon, car caravel, and the sloop. Nice. Now, um, Britt, the, the words, the cards with just the text on them, they look like it looked like the text was um, flush right up against the edge of the card. Is that just an illusion, or is that the way they really look? Um, that might just be an illusion. Like, because we're not seeing the whole graphic or something? Um, yeah, because it just might be small, because it's a small card. It looks a bit bigger in Tabletop Simulator. I haven't actually uploaded them to Tabletop to see what they look like, but... Okay. Yeah, because... Now, just a reminder, you guys... We do have the capability to print all of these games in the real world, especially if you take things like the cards and you, you make them in the template from Game Crafter. And, uh, you know, just to sort of remind you guys what that looks like, let me let me go to the Game Crafter website and then I'll share my screen uh, once I have uh, the template. Well, actually, you know what? I'll bet you I have one on my computer here. So let me just do a quick search for a poker card. Um, and then we'll have something to look at. All right. So we'll type in poker card and let's see what I come up with here. Well, there's, okay, here's one right there. I'll just, I'll just open this one. Okay. Let me go ahead and share my screen again. All right. Come in here and then share the screen, share it again. Okay, and then my computer's being fairly slow today. You can see the heinous amount of time that it's taking to open things. I, you know, I'm at that point where I gotta copy everything off my computer onto a external hard drive and reformat it kind of thing. But <laughs> anyway, so so we're gonna we're gonna see the poker card template come up, and you're gonna see that you have different lines. You know, just as a reminder, you have what's called the bleed line which is if you want color to go all the way to the edge, you know, right where they cut, you have to take that color past the cut line all the way to the edge to the bleed line, right? So here's an example of a card from the Game Crafter template. You can go to gamecrafter.com. You can log in, uh, you know, with the, the Pima ID that I shared with you guys, or you can even just make your own account and you can download these templates. Now, if you're if you're making cards for your game anyway, I highly recommend you, you just make them using these templates. And the reason is because at the end of the semester, if we want to send this stuff off to Game Crafter, you know, Pima has a budget for us to print to print these games as real world games. And then, you know, you could see you could have a box and you could have the cards and everything. And it's it's just really fun to see these things. Um, but anyway, so this is the template. You know, obviously you have your content in there. The, the blue line is going to be what's called the safe zone. 
So you keep all of your content inside of that dotted blue line so that it doesn't get cut off, right? The edge of the card here in this gray area is called the bleed area. So if you want your card to have a colored edge, like, you know, Brit's cards had the, I noticed there was kind of like a brown border around at least one of the ship cards that I saw. So what he would do is he would take that brown and he would fill all this gray with the brown and he would probably take the brown all the way into the this area here with the safe zone and then when it when the card got cropped and that's what this red line is that's the crop line then he would just have the brown from here to here and then maybe he'd shrink his content a little bit inside the blue safe zone so it wouldn't quite touch the brown border it would just be a little inside there so um yeah so you know like i said uh download these card templates and and put your artwork in there and then not only will it look good, but it'll be it'll be all ready to go if, if we want to print it. Okay, uh, good. Nice job on that, Britt. So uh, who else has got something they want to share with us? Anybody else? Let's see, open up my chat here. Okay, any other artwork or screenshots or tabletop simulator or anything from you guys? Okay, I'm hearing a large amount of silence, which I'm thinking means go on to the next thing. Okay, so uh, let's see. Pima.com. All right, so the next thing is, um, I'm just going to spend a, a few minutes talking about the next chapter in the textbook. Um, and I have that all loaded up right here. And this is the second section of the textbook. It's called Chance and Skill talk about this for a few minutes and give you guys some time to work with your teams on your games. So um, it says, let me see if I can make this bigger um, so that we can, you guys can actually read along with this stuff. Okay, so it says, um, games such as Chess and Go are purely strategic. And that's one of the cool things about those games. You know, if we talk about the spectrum of games and over here there is complete, you know, strategy and over here there's complete luck. You know, over here you've got chess and, and go, and over here you've got, well, essentially gambling, you know, where you throw dice at a roulette wheel or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know that you throw dice at a roulette wheel. I'm just, you know, making the thing, throw dice on a, on a, on a, a poker table or something, a uh, blackjack table. But anyway, um, so then all the other games uh, occupy some area in between where they're, you know, they're more luck-based or they're more skill-based. Of course, in a perfect world, you've got a game that's right up in the middle, an equal amount of chance uh, and skill, and then that makes it interesting for the players. It says all information is available to the players, once again talking about chess and go, and the same actions always end in exactly the same results. For the majority of games, however, this is not the case. Most games aren't, you know, that wide open. Um, most games contain at least some factors that are random or not repeatable. For instance, many card games involve a random shuffle. Combat in most RPGs includes a variable damage range. A game like Rock, Paper, Scissors has dynamics that appear random even though even without any random mechanics. This chapter explores the random aspects of games and how a designer can use them. So it talks about the role of chance in games. Uh, why do so many games include an element of chance? In creating a game an entire family could play, for instance, a hardcore strategy game is not likely to work so well. Well, why is that the case, do you guys think? with, um, it, you're, you know, you make a game for a family of four, why is a hardcore strategy game not gonna work? It might be difficult to teach to the kids. Um, also, you know, if you end up with one, one player in the family, one or two players who just always win, you know, that just sours relationships right. in terms of playing the game, so. So you have to think about like, okay, let's take the, you know, the stereotypical nuclear family, which probably doesn't really exist anymore in the way we thought of it, but like mom and a dad, uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, families can be anything, two moms, two dads, you know, partners living together, adopted kids, you name it, right? Animals. Uh, so, let, but let's take mom, dad, you know, boy, girl, this sort of generic stereotypical family, right? Um, you know, the best games that are going to be entertaining to everybody are going to occupy the common ground between all of them. And like if you've got, you know, a young boy and a young girl, they don't have the advanced skills to, you know, think three steps ahead in a strategy game like Risk. You know, um, of course, they're maybe not the age of just, you know, shoots and ladders anymore. 
but there's a middle ground there, which is a combination of skill and chance that makes it fun for everybody. Um, let's see, it says, on the other hand, games that include an element of luck are approachable and winnable by a wider audience. Ultimately, there are many reasons, but each is a conscious decision by the designer to create the desired dynamics. Okay, so next, delaying or preventing solvability. A game is solvable if the entire possibility space is known ahead of time and can be exploited, such that a specific player playing correctly can always win or draw. Part of the reason that tic-tac-toe fails to remain compelling for long is that it can be easily solved, right? Like, I don't know anybody that plays tic-tac-toe, you know, for fun. I mean, like, you know, once you play tic-tac-toe once, you're like, okay, done. You know, I get the concept. I'm not really going to do this, you know, as a as an occupation, as a part-time job, or even a fun venture, because it's just too silly, right? Um, once a player solves a game, the game loses part of what makes a game what makes it a game in the first place. An uncertain outcome, uh, let's see, an uncertain outcome is struggle towards a goal. That's what makes a game interesting, right? Solvable, solvable games are not automatically bad. Chess is solvable, but the possibility space is so large that it continues to entertain. For games with small enough possibility spaces to be solvable by computer, and especially human, however, something must be done to keep the game fresh. Adding a random element is one way to accomplish this. It prevents us from mastering the game because making the same exact decisions may lead to different outcomes. Okay, so that's why we introduce random factors. Okay, making play competitive for all players. In a pure strategic game like chess, a sufficiently strong player will always beat a weaker player. Some people are competitive enough to enjoy the aspect of games, knowing that if they beat another player, that they wholly earned that victory. Likewise, if they lost, they know it was through their error or another player's skill, not a random roll of the die. While this might be fine for some players and result in compelling gameplay, People can't always count on two equally matched players being available at the same time and the same place for a game. If all games were all about skill, games between a parent and a child would generally result in a tear-laden defeat after tear-laden defeat, boredom or frustration, right? That's not really, I mean, unless you're using the game as a form of punishment, that's probably not the way you want to go, right? Yeah, sounds like a bad time. Right, exactly. The kids are bad. The kids have been bad. Bring out the risk, you know, or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is what, what Jazz was alluding to earlier. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Where do we get? Okay, the weaker player simply gets up and walks away, determined to never play the game again, or at least not with the same person, right? Random elements that occasionally allow a less experienced player to win, or at least offer an advantage, keep these players interested for longer in two ways. First, there's always the chance of victory. Second, the sting of defeat is lessened when a player can blame her own bad luck, right? So, you know, in a way, you're giving the player, uh, you know, especially in this type of scenario, you're giving them two outs. One is, oh, I lost, but it was just the luck of the die, right? Or, oh, you know, the, the luck of the die gave me a win, you know? So suddenly, you know, both possibilities, both both extremes are possible, right? Okay, increasing variety. Uh, games with no random elements always start exactly the same, and certain patterns, such as book openings in chess, often emerge. As a result, players can have highly similar experiences from one game to another, and they can find themselves making the same kinds of strategic choices. When a random element is introduced, players must cope with a wider variety of situations. The random setup of Settlers of Catan makes each game feel different. Tile-based games often allow players to build in dozens of different ways. The random battles in Risk or Axis and Allies require players to change their strategies and often play in unconventional or innovative ways when the, when the dice do not act as one hoped they would. Adding random elements in the right way can increase the variety of a player's experience, thus increasing the replay value of a game. Now, there's a couple of things to take away from this. One is, you know, going back to talking about the family dynamics, right? There's no such thing as a truly neutral game because what happens is you bring the existing family dynamics to the game, right? And, and in all families or even all groupings of friends, you know, um, there, there's always different dynamics. There's people whose voice is listened to more often and is more commanding. There's people who are quieter. There's people who are very competitive and people that will just go along with anything. And then every shade in between, right? 
So when you create a game, it's already, by definition, not a neutral stomping ground. People are going to bring their personalities and their characteristics to it. The aggressive, you know, double A personality is going to say, hey, let's play a game and grab the game off the shelf and start setting it up. Maybe somebody's going to be dragged to the game board. Maybe somebody else would be kind of interested. You know, you've already got these different interest levels and these different personalities, you know, the type A people, the type B people. And so you have to make your game, uh, you know, as neutral as possible and accommodate all those different personality types. And like they were saying, make, you know, introduce uh, random elements like chance to make it equally fun for everybody. So not just the smart people always win. Sometimes, you know, the lucky people win. Um, okay, and they also talk about the replay value of a game, which is the second point I want to make. You know, games are not played just once. When you buy a game, you're actually making an investment. You, you want to get a certain amount of replays out of the game, and the only way you can is if every game, every version of that game played is slightly different. Okay, um, creating dramatic moments. When a player carefully ca uh, crafts a strategy and then has to depend on the roll of the dice or what have you to see if the plan succeeds, that moment of truth can be deliciously tense. Role-playing games, RPGs, real-time strategy games, RTSs, and many, many board games rely on this tension for play. Will your healing spell get to your wounded partner before the monster strikes? Will the AI give you two creatures to battle or one? I'm thinking of, uh, of Creed's game now, right? Um, will the player right. land on your recently developed park place or boardwalk or just pass it by? Even without strategy, watching a random process play out can be extremely compelling in the right circumstances. Witness the excitement at a roulette or craps table. The level of excitement or tension created by chance increases in direct proportion to how much one has riding on the results. So if you can create games that, you know, sort of naturally or organically or by design build tension, you know, like, you know, every round of your game, you know, uh, increases the stakes, you know, well, let's use the poker game, for example, right? Um, not to say that this is something you need to do, but what if every round of poker that you played that the, the uh, value of the chips, you know, automatically doubled or went up by a third or something like that, you know, um, or, or what if, what if you guys put, um, what if you guys added like sort of mission cards to the poker game? I know this is completely against what you guys are talking about, but I'm just trying to give an example. What if everybody took a secret mission uh, card before the poker game? And what happened was some of the cards said, your ranch is going to be foreclosed unless you make $50,000. And another one said, you know, you've got $10,000 in the bank. If you buy this stock and spend, you know, all, spend an additional $10,000, you'll triple your money, right? So in other words, each person could come to the game with a different secret mission about how much money they need to make. And that would that would color, you know, when they drop out of rounds and when they bet heavy. And then that adds that tension we're talking about. You know, as the pot goes up, these people, you know, it becomes more important for them to win or to get out because they could lose everything, right? Okay, uh, let's see where we stop. Okay, ending decision, enhancing decision making. The essence of most games is the decisions that the players make. In a pure strategy game, players have complete information, like chess, you can see everything and know the exact outcome of every move that they make. Since all variables are known, some decisions aren't particularly exciting. If you have the opportunity to capture your opponent's queen in chess for free with no drawbacks, it's not much of an interesting decision because there is a clear right answer. When random elements exist in a game, there's no longer a strategy that is always right. Some moves might have a high chance of failure, but also a big potential payoff, making them a risky choice. Other moves might be safe, but only with a small gain. A player thus analyzes the different moves, their relative risks and benefits, and weighs them with respect to their perceived position in the game. Since there are unknown elements, the decisions become more complicated and thus more compelling. So let me ask you guys. So, you know, there's something called risk-benefit analysis that we all do, you know, sort of consciously or subconsciously in our daily lives, you know should I buy that burrito or, you know, should I get this uh, spaghetti or this mac cheese, you know, like what costs more, what's going to taste better, what's going to make me feel weird later on, you know, that's a small example. A bigger example might be, you know, should I take this class this semester? Should I buy this car right now? Should I move in with this person, right? The, the sort of the bigger the stakes, the, the bigger the risk and reward, right? Now, can any of you guys give me an example of this sort of 
um, you know, risk analysis benefit that might exist in your games that you're working on? Yeah, so in our game, the Cthulhu-like one, it's, uh, I would say, like, there's a risk in using too much of your stat cards because, you know, you can use them, like, there's one, for example, that'll boot, that'll, like, heal you a certain amount. And so I feel like there's a risk in using that because then at the end of the game, when you could then fight all of your friends, you're then like, if someone else in the game used less stat cards, now they have an advantage over you because they saved some. So, but then in, when you're in the middle of a battle with a monster, you're like, oh, I'm going to die. Should I yeah. use it or save it? <laughs> right. So it kind of reminds me, it's, I, I like the mechanic a lot. It kind of rem reminds me of the parable of uh, the tortoise and the hare, you know, the race, right? Yes, right. So, you know, basically what you're saying is the winning strategy is to be slow and steady. Yeah, because right. Because if you hang on to your cards, you're going to uh, you're gonna win. That that yeah. reminds me, that kind of analogy always reminds me of the, of the comparison between my brother and I. I have a brother who's, who's a year older than me. And he was always the saver, you know, he would always take all his money and put it in a box, you know, and I was always yeah. spending money, like I'd spend money I didn't have, I'd spend mo other people's money, you know, and, <laughs> you know, so that's, so all through our lives, it's been the same thing, you know, oh, I really want a new car. Oh, I can, you know, my brother was like, oh, I can afford to buy a new car. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I have to go sell my soul, sell plasma to get a car, right? <laughs> yeah, and, right. Uh, you know, so it's interesting because, because your dynamic uh, creed is also going to be affected by the personalities of the people playing, right? Right. So like if, if my brother and I were playing your game, he would absolutely, without doubt, you know, save the proper amount of cards for the end and kick my ass, you know? But yeah, I, right. Like, I'd be all like, throw, you know, throw those cards, wipe the monster out. Yeah, I know. No. I'd be about the short, the short victory thrill. And then at the end, I'd be like, oh shit, you know? I know, wait, now we're here? <laughs> yeah, right. Now, Considering that, I wonder if you might consider this creed. I wonder if you might consider some mechanics like that come in near the end of the game that might save the personality types like me that are just like spendthrifts, you know? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, right. Like some kind of mechanic where, like, then by some mechanic, you can try to like get, uh, like, dr get like some kind of draw from the stat deck somehow. Yeah. It's almost like, it's almost it's almost like betting the house or something like that. Like, right. like what if, what if you could get to that, uh, you know, the second to the last round or something like that. And you gave people the option it's do or die option, right? You, you take however many cards you have left and you can, you can stake them on a dice roll and you're either going to get three times that card back or you're just dead. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. That that's kind of fun because oh, yeah, I like you know, that, that person's going to lose anyway. Because right. They, 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 they shot, you know, they, yeah. They, just by virtue of having no stat cards to fight to like, yeah. Using right. in the battle. So, yeah. So what you do is you accommodate that type of personality. Now on the other side of things, you know, uh, the, the person who's very steady might complain about that mechanic. Like I did everything right. And you gave that guy. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so you might, I, and I,
And that's kind of nice.